neck to knee to who next to nothing at all. What goes in one era and out the other? Come back with us through the decades and revisit the crazes and the crazies. The things we love to remember and the things we're trying to forget. As we take our hat off to all those who've won and lost as slaves to fads and fashion. It's still the same old story, a fight for love and glory, a case of do or die. The world will always welcome the lovers as time goes by. Back in the early 1930s, the biggest craze around was mini golf. And what better place to play it than on the site of another strange fad? This temple overlooking Sydney's Middle Harbour was built for an Indian mystic who'd conned a group of Sydney siders into believing that Christ's second coming was imminent and that he would walk across the waters and up onto Balmoral Beach. Alas, he was late then and still is. Today, there's a massive block of home units on the site where the saviour failed to arrive, but the mini-golf craze is still a minor religion for some. Like all fads, it goes in and out, and more often than not these days, the carpeted greens wind up as a place for mum to park dad and the kids while she goes shopping. <laughs> Children, of course, are the major supporters of any fad, and for boys at least, it's usually got to have wheels. With prices of some of the crazes running into hundreds of dollars, these kids are the apple of a greedy manufacturer's eye. And it's a far cry from the days when we made our fun out of our own fruit box. They're racing. What a race, what excitement, what a thrill, what joy for every boy. And as they round the turn for home and into the street, I mean the straight wild excitement prevails. No speed cops about. And here's a real thrill, a real thrill. Look out, look out. It's really fresh, really. I never expected to run into you. Concrete Charlie is the winner. It's a little known fact, but one of the most successful fads in history was actually an Australian invention. Born here in the 1950s, the hula hoop was taken by an American to California, where the Whammo company turned it into a craze which led to the sales of 50 million hoops. The hoop took America by a storm, graduating from a children's toy to a teenage status symbol, and finally to something of an art form. For some strange reason though, the hoop doesn't keep coming back like that all-time evergreen, the yo-yo. And maybe that's got something to do with who's pulling the strings. There are big bickies involved in some crazes, while others seem to vanish overnight. Like the art of long-distance decanting. The milk bar was another Aussie invention. The first ever strawberry malted was thrown here in Sydney's Martin Place in 1933. And soon the nation's soda jerks were outdoing each other in epic feats of liquid sculpture. But apart from moo moo moving and hula hoops, most of our crazes have come from the old US of A. Like the short-lived fad of phone box stuffing. And they've done it. 25. Uncle Sam's given us everything from pogo sticks to 10-pin bowling to fast food. Colonel Sanders is in Australia with a delicious new way to enjoy chickens. And of course, the daddy of them all came direct from Hollywood. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Star Drive. In the 1950s, with no TV, good weather and plenty of wide open spaces, the drive-in, like this one at Alice Springs, was perfectly suited to our lifestyle. They were great. You could do everything here, you could do at home, but at the theatre. And you could smuggle a few mates and a few bottles of beer in the boot as well. When I was a kid, I can remember coming to places like this around twilight, and I can almost hear the sound of the speaker crashing on the glass as we hooked it on, and more often than not, the volume knob fell off completely. But the main feature would start and would settle down for some fun and games, maybe on the front seat and maybe on the back. And at worst, it would rain and would peer through the windscreen wipers watching Charlton Heston build the pyramids. How did television compete with all that? 
Will you please leave plates, knives and forks on the base of the speaker stand? Thank you for your attention. We hope you have a very enjoyable evening. Thank you. And after the break, the enjoyable evening continues as we slip into something more comfortable. Manly Beach in Sydney. Governor Phillips first port of call even before he declared Australia open. These days you can wear or not wear pretty well anything you like. But in 1902, believe it or not, you couldn't swim anywhere in Sydney in daylight hours. That was until the editor of the Manly Daily, a towy little bloke named William Gosher, decided to take a stand in his paper. After a bit of huffing and puffing in some editorials, he decided it was time for a showdown. Mr Gosher appeared here at the stroke of noon, clad in nothing but his neck-to-knee bathing costume. He strode across the beach and plunged into the surf in broad daylight, heaven forbid. The crowd oohed and aahed and then cheered him to a man. And two policemen who'd been standing here watching the whole thing took no action whatsoever. Gosher repeated his performance on the following Sunday, but still no arrest was made. And finally, on the third Sunday, the authorities apparently decided they could no longer accept this flagrant challenge to the law and to moral decency. The police swooped on William Gosher. He, he asked to be taken to High Court to see Inspector Fosby. And Inspector Fosby said, Mr Gosher, I've been reading with delight. He said, you've won the day. He said, all day surf bathing from now on, as long as the women are properly clothed, must have a neck to knee costume and the bosom must not be shown. Gosha's victory was complete. Within a year, daylight bathing was legalised and soon became as popular as it remains today. As for that bit about the bosom must not be shown, well, we'd get around that, but it would take three quarters of a century. In fact, over the years, it seems the swimsuit has been shrinking about an inch a decade. Among the unlikely trailblazers were the Lasker family of George Street, Sydney. Mr Lasker roped in mum, dad, the kids and auntie Min to model some heavy woolen numbers that would have sunk even the most buoyant matron. But if the models were a bit, don't call us, we'll call you, in 1918, these fashions sizzled like a thong on the esplanade in January. The swimsuit, bathers, cozies, togs, whatever you want to call them, were soon part of any young lady's trousseau. And even in our very first Miss Australia contest in 1927, the girls were thoroughly tested for Australian conditions. Back in the 1930s, the swimsuit was still based on the novel notion that it should actually cover a fair bit of a woman's body. In those days, when Australia really did ride on the sheep's back, the swimsuit was a full-fashioned woolen garment that could take about a yard of material. Oh, don't wake me up, I'm dreaming. In the 40s, 50s and 60s, the costume evolved from a single-piece, well-constructed garment that was never really meant to get wet, to two relatively demure pieces of cloth, to cover three relatively demure pieces of girl. Designers tried to outdo each other with elaborate additions that made the cosy decent enough to wear on the patio, darling. But in 1946, the atom bomb tests at Bikini Atoll inspired a Frenchman to design a swimsuit that is still regarded by some Aussie men as the greatest invention in the history of the world. It was called the Bikini. The fallout from the Bikini explosion soon spread around the planet and the brown bombers on beaches like Bondi went about their business with relish. A peculiar period of history when wrinkly old men told beautiful young women they looked obscene. Wowserism ruled, and when a young woman named Joan Barry deliberately challenged decency regulations in 1961, the famous inspector Orr Bladelaw could only do his duty. I spoke to her about the brevity of a costume, and I said, well, it'll have to come to the pavilion till I take particulars of your name and address so you can be summoned by the council. What exactly was she wearing at the time? She was wearing a two-piece bikini, very brief on the sides, about an inch, separated the front from the back on the sides, and very low cut, with just about 
hold the, the front portion of a body. It was an itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow. Over the years, the swimsuit has evolved to the point where there's not much left to complain about. The wags called the string bikini dental floss. And all those battles over bare bums and bosoms now seem like the classic storm in a V-cup. And as for those daring young women with the parking strip tees, the meter maids, well now, 30 years after they seem so daring, what do you reckon they do these days when they're not feeding meters? You guessed it, they deliver meals on wheels. While they were taking their clothes off in Sydney, in Melbourne they were putting them on in a big way. Fashion, furs, fun and fripperies are... For most of its fashion history, Australia has survived on imported styles and ideas. This advertising short was made in 1911 to display the latest outfits available from the exclusive Melbourne store, George's. And it shows just how ludicrous British designs were in the Australian environment. Heavy coats, furs and even muffs might have been just the thing for a European winter, but not even Melbourne's climate could have justified this wholesale slaughter of rabbits in the cause of high fashion. Yet, no matter how grotesque the trend, Australian women have remained dedicated followers of fashion, even if it meant draping a dead fox over each shoulder. By the 1920s, style-conscious ladies had aligned their taste to the prevailing mood of feminism. Fast young women were openly smoking cigarettes through a long-distance arrangement, and even made personal calls on the telephone without being formally introduced. The spirit of liberation was so strong that by the 1930s, the ladies were even allowed to do their own commentaries for the newsreel. A complete expression of independence was gained in the beach shots of recent seasons. Now, women have reverted with their innate love of the beautiful to long skirts. And Miss 1931 combines the classic lines of a hundred years ago in this, the new divided skirt gown. The austerity years of the Depression, followed by the war, put fashion in a straitjacket for a couple of decades. And even by the late 40s and early 50s, Australian women were still struggling to break free from the tyranny of sober-sided suits and sensible shoes. Even when bold young Miss Australias proudly paraded their wardrobes, they were stayed in keeping with the suburban lifestyles we were leading. For our fledgling fashion designers, it was all just too depressing. Oh, suburbia, suburbia, the cotton printed frocks, hideous, hideous. So I rebelled terribly, though, blue rinsed Aussies that, oh no, 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 even the thought of it, the, even the flashback makes me cringe a bit. Even by the start of the so-called swing in 60s, Aussie women dressed in the manner of English matrons. Indeed, fashion statements by the Queen's personal frock designer, Norman Hartnell, bless his noble heart, were treated like royal decrees. Have women got waists at the moment? They have got waists, though, but yes. And uh, how much leg have they got? Oh, just about two inches of the kneecap. I see. Thank you, Mr Hartnell. Yes, thank you, Mr Hartnell. Back then, what was good enough for the Queen was good enough for us. But on Melbourne Cup Week 1965, we weren't quite prepared for the arrival of a British model named Jean Shrimpton. Good Lord, the brazen hussy was practically naked. Not only did she show almost a quarter of a thigh, but she had no hat, no gloves, and horror of horrors, no stockings. To make matters worse, the cheeky little minx was wearing a man's watch. It was front page news, and the good matrons of Melbourne were mortified. Most disappointed indeed. You think she should have worn a hat? Oh, most definitely. One's entitled to their own opinion. I wear what I like, they wear what they like. It's almost impossible to comprehend now the outraged indignation that surrounded Jean Shrimpton's hemline here at Flemington in 1965. But you have to remember that this was the first deliberately exposed human knee ever seen inside the member's enclosure. You must remember Yes, it all seemed pretty silly, all right. But you have to keep in mind that fashion, what we wear, is really the moral barometer of the nation. And after the break, we check out some of the highs and some of the lows. The swinging 60s, the dawning of the age of Aquarius, and the dawning of the age of the dag, 
In our desperate urge not to conform, we were soon in a uniform of our own. At the premiere of musicals like Hair, the cast wore nothing and the audience, well, too much. And even though it didn't seem possible, fashion was about to get even worse. It was hard to tell who looked sillier, the girls or the boys. Flashing lights highlight the hundreds of hand-sewn sequins and present a fashion that is certainly an example of tomorrow's clothes today. The 70s truly was the decade that style forgot. It was a time when you could throw good fashion sense out of the window and build a career around it. Yet while the glam look enjoyed a short time on top, downstairs it was denim all the way. From the very moment this little-known American fabric arrived on our shores, it was a case of unconditional love. Genetics. Yet if they were a fashion that refused to fade, there were others that were mercifully less durable. And the high priest of the fashion faux pas was our own Federal Minister for Ethnic Affairs, Al Grasby. I can remember an old senator saying to me, you couldn't possibly go into the chamber in that, could you? I said, I am, I will, and I think it's eminently sensible, and why don't you catch up with the 70s? Well, I saw him the other day, and he was wearing white shoes. The revolution is here. Today is... No matter how ridiculous some of the fashions look now, and yes, we were all guilty, even us style leaders... We'll take a break. We have to give the 70s credit for one thing. If nothing else, we were finally dressing for comfort. Blokes now had a new uniform and stubbies. And according to young designers like Prue Acton, it was time for the Sheilas to wear the trousers. What's sexy about a woman in trousers? Um, if they're well cut and if they're floppy, crepey ones, and if a girl has the right figure, it can be very sexy indeed. <laughs> you don't believe me? No. for the 1971 Wool Awards had a difficult job evaluating... However, while our early designers struggled to make an impression overseas, it wasn't an outfit that finally put us on the map. It was a body. When Elle McPherson sashayed onto the international modelling scene in the early 1980s, Australia was more famous for sports than fashion. But over the next decade, Elle helped introduce some of that Australian style to the world. Hard on the heels of the supermodel came designers like Colette Dinnigan, whose understanding of the unique Australianness spilled out of her creations. I have a strong sense of colour, so, and perhaps that does come from living in a country that has a lot of sunshine, and you know our lives are very much focused on the outdoors and entertainment. And I think we're quite decadent in a way. Perhaps not that we live in castles and things, but we know how to live a good life, and we like to show it. And I think that's shown through the clothes we wear. Sure, we love to blow our own didgeridoo, but there's no doubt that Aussie style is now being celebrated in the fashion capitals of the world. Along with Dinnigan and Trent Nathan, names like Akira, Morrissey, Zampatti, George Gross and Harry Hu also strut their stuff. And the good news, we're exporting it all round the world. Sure, we're still pinching a few ideas from overseas, but at least we're wearing clothes now that suit the Australian environment and clothes that are distinctly Australian. Certainly it's a long way from those days when a fur coat and a fox stole were just the ticket for a night on the town. But there's always a lingering question when it comes to the end of the catwalk. How much does the world of haute couture, high fashion, touch the lives of the average Australian mum? For Josephine Edwards and her family, who you met last week, and who were joining on their personal journey through time, this fashionable century was a little more down to earth. But not without glamour. Even though wartime rationing was still in force when Ken and Josephine were married in 1942, the bride looked absolutely gorgeous in her exquisite handmade dress of chul and broderie anglaise. Indeed, she was so beautiful, Ken probably wouldn't have noticed if she'd been wearing a sugar bag. Mum looked very smart too as the wedding headed off to the Great Northern for the reception. 
As for fads, well, not too many in those days, except everyone seemed to smoke. Capstan, Ardath, Turf and Cravenay. And, oh yes, this was another. In those days, everyone seemed to name their car, no matter how humble a jalopy. This little Austin was called Belinda. Finally brought Belinda home from the dealer today. Joey delighted, really will look like the smart couple about town. And of course, Ken was a passionate pioneer of a fad that was to become one of the greatest crazes of the 20th century. In the 1930s, he was one of the very few Australians who owned a movie camera. And it's his lifetime devotion to recording his intimate world that's ensured his small but important place in our history.